Chapter 20 of Exodus, beginning with verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. You shall do, not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, your livestock or alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rest of the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thank be to you. God. Every fall when the leaves start to turn, uh, and they started this week, my body knows it, and it results in a sore throat. I am not infected, I just have sinus issues. Uh, and I had trouble at 8.30 keeping my focus, so I'm going to pray that you help me keep my focus right now, okay? And we can get through this together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, you've given us your word. You've given us a word that's important in our lives, and I pray, Lord, that you help us hear you, not me, but help us to hear you speak to our lives, speak to our hearts about these commandments. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there is a very key verse in verse 5, very key phrase in verse 5. And it answers the question, why does God give the Ten Commandments? Why does he give them to us? I mean, what purpose? In verse 5, there is that little phrase that says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now let's review that. We've been over this before. The word jealous in today's society is a very negative term. Uh, we think of that being possessive, like things. And, but in the scripture in the Hebrew, in this case, it means I, the Lord your God, and a jealous God is I am red in the face in love with you. I love you more than anything. Like when we were kids, and we fall in love with someone, we blush. We think about that person all the time. That person never goes out of our mind. We want to talk to them. We want to be around them. Uh, we get excited. And if you understand that, when, Jesus, when God says, I am a jealous God, he's saying, I love you red in the face. I think about you all the time. You're on my mind now and now and now, even at this moment in this room. And I am so in love with you. Now, because God is so in love with us, he wanted to create a boundary for us so that we can have a playground in which to live. The laws were not given to oppress. The laws were given to say, hey, here's some boundaries that will provide safety for you, just like we provided for our children boundaries that would be safe for the children as they grow up. And these laws, then, were to be a blessing. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7 where he says, uh, What then should we say? Is the law that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known that boundary. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. And so then going on to verse 12, he says, The law is holy, and the commandment is holy, just and good. It's a blessing. God gave it to us as a blessing. Now, let me just give you a practical example today. I don't think anyone in this room came to worship today without being in a vehicle of some kind. No one walks to church anymore, unless you live right next door. So we rode. Now, there are laws about driving. Those laws are not meant to be oppressive. 
The laws are meant to say, okay, here are the safe guidelines. And my suspicion is very few of us were afraid while we were in the car. Because if every one of us are following the law, then there's less chance of an accident. And so we've had a freeing experience driving. Now, if there were no laws, then we'd constantly be on the lookout if someone would come after me or whatever. The laws were meant to give us freedom. Just like when you play a game, you want to know the rules of the game so you can enjoy the game. This afternoon is going to be football. You know the rules of the game so the guys can play the game and enjoy it with a minimum amount of injury. God gives us the law to be a playground. But for years now, people have been, at least 90 years it's been documented, there's been a conscientious effort to remove the influence of the Christian faith uh, in, in America, especially in government. Um, especially the Ten Commandments lately. But if you go back to the original documents, not the ones that have been edited, the original documents that have been edited, but if you go back to the original documents before they were edited, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, all of them said that the Constitution and the laws of our land were based upon the Ten Commandments, based upon the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount and the Scriptures, because we were to be a Christian, one nation under God. I mean, that's very clear. But there's been an attempt to get rid of it. And in 2003, Supreme Court Chief Justice of the state of Alabama, Roy Moore, was removed from office because he refused to take down the monument to the Ten Commandments in front of the court. Now, there are good Christians on both sides of that issue. But it doesn't matter whether we have a monument to them or not. We as a nation have begun to not pay attention to them anymore. In fact, the majority of people surveyed said, I prefer to, to obey two or three of them, but not all of them. And we want everyone else to obey them, but we don't want to obey them ourselves. And, and the result is uh, the Ten Commandments are, are going on the wayside. Now, I grew up in the counterculture. I mean, I was in college right in the middle of the countercultural revolution. Uh, well, let's have free love, you know, free love. I don't know how I didn't get caught up in it, but fortunately I survived it. But a lot of my brothers didn't. There, there was, the focus was, let's get rid of oppressive boundaries. Let's get rid of rules and laws and oppression. And uh, there was, in one case, I'm aware of, a group of parents of a private school decided, let's get rid of the fence around the playground. And by getting rid of the fence, we're going to begin to teach our children how to live without boundaries. Well, they thought that was a great idea, that the children would be psychologically healthier and freer. But what they discovered was just the very opposite. Before the fences were taken down, the children felt free to play in the entire playground. They played against the fence. They played on this side. They, played, they would climb the fence. They enjoyed the whole playground. But when the fences went down, instead of the children even leaving the playground, the opposite happened. They came back to the center of the playground because they didn't know where the boundaries were, and they were afraid. Those same parents decided to get rid of all the rules in the school except the one, study and make your grades. Irony, the opposite happened the students' grades went down. Boundaries are a blessing so that we know where and how to play the game. And yes, 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 you can legislate morality. When, in the 1970s, we had the energy crisis and the speed limit was lowered from the 60s down to 55, accidents on the interstate and all the other places went down. When the law speed limit went back up, accidents went back up. Uh, people said prohibition didn't work. No, prohibition did work. Alcoholism in America was at a peak. Prohibition came in. The amount of alcoholism was at the lowest peak during that period of time. But of course, they, all the revenuers and all the moonshiners and all that was going on. People say it's not working. Well, as soon as prohibition was eliminated, alcoholism shot sky high again. 
in the 70s and 80s, there was experiments by states of lowering the drinking age from 21 to 18. When they did that, alcoholism among college students shot up. Those states that moved back to 21, it went down. You can legislate morality. Because when people have the boundaries, they tend to stick within those boundaries. Now, why do they stick within the boundaries? Four reasons. One, not everyone does, obviously. But number one is they're people with integrity, and that's just what they're going to do. Number two is fear. They're afraid to break because something might happen. Third reason, especially in relationship with God, it's manipulation. It, like the rich young ruler. Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? What did Jesus do? He quoted the Ten Commandments. He said, well, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, uh, honor your parents, et cetera, et cetera. He said, well, I do all those things. So that mean I get it? Jesus said, well, you, you like one thing. Go sell all you have, give to the poor, come follow me. Now, that's not meant for everybody. That was meant for him because he saw the kingdom of heaven as something to possess. What Jesus was trying to say is, get rid of everything you're trying to possess, including the kingdom of heaven. He wanted things from God, but not God. And Jesus is saying, no, have a relationship with me, because then you'll have the kingdom of heaven, because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Have the relationship with me. Now, the fourth way people follow the commandments is simply the great commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You see, Paul explains, Paul explains in Galatians chapter 3, he says that in verse 24, the law was our custodian, our disciplinarian, our teacher, depends on which translation, our trustee until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. In other words, the law, the Ten Commandments, is the minimum of our relationships with God and each other. It's the bottom line. But just because we follow the Ten Commandments does not mean we have a relationship with Christ. Husbands and wives, parents and children, just because you don't kill your spouse, some of you may want to, just because you don't kill your spouse, because you don't commit adultery, you don't steal, you don't lie, does that mean your spouse knows that you love them? No, love is something far greater than what we don't do. It's what we do do. We go out of the way to love the other. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you find it here. Jesus says, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus didn't come to get rid of the Ten Commandments. He came to fulfill it. Instead of focusing on not doing things, we concentrate on loving instead. And in the process of loving, what happens? Well, we're not going to kill. You're not going to steal. If you love somebody, you're not going to hurt them. You're going to do everything you can to help that person. That's fulfilling the law. And we can't do that. Only Christ can do that, which means we ask Jesus, lead me. I can't do this. Lead me. Lead me. Lead me. Um, let me just give you an example of how this works. Um, fall of 2003, at my previous church, um, Judy Hoffman, the other pastor at the church, saw four boys take a whole bunch of things, put it in a car, and then spin out. She knew they had just robbed the church. She checked around. Yep, several things were missing. Well, she had an ID on the church, I mean, on the, on the car. She went down to Franklin High and found the car. Called the police. Boys got caught. Four of them. At court, she represented the church. And I don't remember the exact words, but she said that when the judge asked what thought about a, a, a proper sentence for the kids, because they admitted it, she said, Judge, we don't want them to go to jail or be in detention center because that means we'll be treating them like things, like they treated us like things. We want relationships. So what we want to do 
is let them come to the church and confess what they did. And then for their public service, we want them to work with us, not for us, but work side by side with us so we get to know them as people and they get to know us as people and relationships develop. The judge looked at her and said, well, there's justice and then there's justice. One justice would have been thrown him into jail. The other justice is to build relationships. Well, the Sunday in January came. The kids at the beginning of the service confessed what they'd done. It was the largest attendance that year, except for Easter. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of gawkers in the world. And they came. When people arrived at church that day, we gave everyone a rock. And we told everyone at the beginning of the service, think about things people did to you, to hurt you. Things said, things done, things not done. How have you been hurt? Our scripture that day was from John 8, the woman caught in the act of adultery. In which the Pharisees and Sadducees and all them bring to Jesus. This woman says, hey, Moses said we're to stone her to death. What do you say? And Jesus said, you're right. He said, stone him. Go ahead and stone him if you're without sin. If you're the f without sin, you can throw it first. And like, obviously the implication there is very simple. Remember, we've been over this. If you have sin and you throw the stone, then the rest of us get to stone you. Who amongst us has not sinned? Well, they all dropped their rocks. Then Jesus says, where are your sinners? And she said, they've gone. I said, he said, then go and sin no more. And, and she left. Several people say that that was Mary Magdalene. We don't know for sure. And what happened was Jesus developed a relationship that was with her to help her to overcome the future. Now, there are people who are just downright mean and evil that need to be locked up. But even if they are locked up, like Connie Christopher does in our jail ministry here, we need to reach out to them because someday they're going to get out. The law of love goes beyond of what we don't do and focuses on what we do do. Because we have a God that in spite of all the bad we've done, who loves us red in the face love that's so intense, he loves us even now, doesn't throw stones at us, but says, I love you, and I want to overcome differences that you and I have with each other. And he says, look, even today, even today, I break my bread. And as I break this bread, I want a relationship with you. That is, I want you to come eat this and let me enter your life in a new way in an area that you've never let enter before. I want relationship with you to strengthen you, to overcome so that you can have the freedom of love of me that lets you play in this playground of world, this heaven, this earth. I want to give you my blood because you're going to make mistakes. But instead of throwing a rock, I want to cleanse you. I want you to receive this love. I want you to receive me today and be forgiven. And then after this, I want you to do the same thing with each other. I want you to care. Care for each other. May we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the blessings of the commandments. But Lord, we know we can't live by them and really enjoy life by itself. We know that you came to fulfill it and that is you bring... You bring love to our relationships. Lord, help us not to live in the lowest common denominator of the Ten Commandments. Help us to live in you that gives life and life eternity and life to our relationships that overcome all the negativity. Lord, I pray at this moment, as we receive communion today, Pray the simple prayer of consecration that your Holy Spirit descend upon us, upon the bread, upon the cup, upon us, 
that we receive your love and your forgiveness and your grace. And if we give thanksgiving, receive healing. And I pray, Lord, as we do this, that it just doesn't stop at the kneeling bench, the kneeling rail. Instead, we take it and become grace to each other in this world. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.